Surgery Kid, welcome back. In this video, we will outline the important factors to consider in anesthetizing patients undergoing eye surgeries. Anesthesia not only plays a role of rendering a patient unconscious during the surgery, but it is of particular importance here because we want the eye to remain on the central position during surgery. And upon anesthetizing, it is expected to be displaced. So it can be quite complicated. Let's start. Anesthesia in ophthalmic patients must attain four main goals. Number one is to provide analgesia. We must maintain or even lower the existing intraocular pressure. We must also find a way to prevent the activation of the oculocardiac reflex. And lastly, we must reach an adequate level of surgical anesthesia for surgical manipulation with normal cardiovascular function. This last thing is consistent for all patients undergoing anesthesia, regardless of the site of surgery. The intraocular pressure, or IOP, is basically the fluid pressure inside the eye. This is determined by the production and drainage of the aqueous humor in the anterior chamber and the resistance to pressure of the fibrous tunics of the cornea and the sclera. The vitreous humor in the posterior chamber does not affect the IOP since it has a relatively fixed volume throughout an animal's life. This pressure is measured by an equipment called a tonometer. Its measurement is based on the corneal thickness and the rigidity. This is the normal IOP values for dogs and cats. Let's see how a tonometer works. Intraocular pressure with a rebound principle. A lightweight sterile probe is inserted intraocular pressure with a rebound principle. A lightweight sterile probe is inserted into the instrument and will gently make contact with the cornea. Tonometry with a tonobet is a very quick process. It requires no anesthetic and should cause no discomfort. It will not place excessive pressure on the eye. As you can see, the tonometer has a sterile probe that will measure the intraocular pressure by continually putting enough pressure on the cornea. Usually after three to five probes, the machine will give you a value of the IOP in that eye. Now, if the tonometer that you used showed you a high value for the IOP, it doesn't necessarily mean immediately that the eye has a condition within or localized in that eye. Since the IOP is a fluid pressure, its value can easily be increased by several things, such as restraint on the neck area, which could be from a leash or during restraint of physical examination. Jugular compression for blood draw from the jugular veins. Or in cases where in a patient it's currently or in their history was exhibiting vomiting, coughing, and gagging. Some procedures such as endotracheal intubation can also cause changes in the IOP. Some anesthetic drugs, sedatives, or even analgesics can also cause increases in IOP. Scenarios wherein a patient is hypoventilating in response to a sudden increase in blood pressure and carbon dioxide levels in the blood can also cause the IOP to rise. Before doing ocular surgeries, you should know that physically manipulating the eye and its associated structures can cause a specific cardiac effect. At times, traction on the extraocular muscles and or putting pressure on the eye itself causes bradycardia and bradyarrhythmias. This is what we call the oculocardiac reflex. This autonomic reflex is mediated by the cranial nerve 5 and cranial nerve 10. 
the afferent or sensory nerve fibers of the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve receives the physical stimuli when the muscles around the eye or the eye itself is manipulated. This signal is sent to the trigeminal ganglion for integration. This ganglion then sends motor signals to the heart through the efferent nerve fibers of the vagus nerve. This then causes a decrease in heart rate and irregularity in heart rhythm. The activation of, the, of this reflex is common in pediatric patients and those of a brachycephalic breed. How can this be prevented or treated? Do you know of any drugs or medications which can counter bradycardia? Yes, the first thing that comes to mind is the anticholinergic drugs. What are the examples of anticholinergic drugs? You would have atropine and what else? Glycopyrrolate. That's right. Pre-medications can be a sedative or an analgesic. Sedatives like acepromazine can be used because of its excellent anxiolysis effect. Anxiolysis, big word. What does it mean? Let's break it down. Basically, anxio means anxiety, and lysis means disintegration or dissolution. So, an anxiolytic drug aims to remove the anxiety of a patient and calm themselves down. It also lowers the blood pressure, which can affect the IOP. However, a precautionary label exists for acepromazine for pediatric and geriatric patients. Benzodiazepines like diazepam and midazolam is another drug family which can be used as a sedative. This is preferred for patients with existing underlying diseases or pathologic conditions. Analgesics are also used as pre-medications because of their inherent sedative effect. Opioids are the usual go-to drug since it provides adequate pain control and its sedative effect has a fast onset. However, full agonist opioids are used with caution since it can cause vomiting in some patients. Can you remember examples of full agonist opioids? Some are on the screen. Morphine, methadone, hydromorphone, and fentanyl. These are just few of the examples. Induction drugs need to be administered in a way which can minimize the tendency of the IOP to increase during surgery. Propofol is the drug of choice for ophthalmic surgeries because of its effect to decrease IOP. This drug can provide a rapid, smooth, and excitement-free onset of general anesthesia, but its duration is also short, ranging from only 3 to nine minutes. It is usually administered through a slow bolus intravenously to avoid apnea, and it is followed by intubation and inhalational anesthetic as maintenance. Recovery after propofol is also very rapid and excitement-free, which is a good thing for ophthalmic patients. Ectomidate also decreases IOP, but also causes myoclonus so it is not advised. On the other hand, ketamine, which is a dissociative anesthetic, is not advisable since it was found to increase the IOP and increase the tone of the extraocular muscles, leading to sudden eye movements. It is only used in conjunction with the diazepam to reduce the possibility of seizures and produce muscular relaxation. Anesthetic induction with gas anesthetics with a mask to a conscious patient is also avoided since it places too much pressure on or near the eyes and causes the IOP to rapidly increase. In doing surgeries wherein we aim for a moderate anesthetic depth, meaning the cardiovascular function is maintained, the vital signs stay within the normal range, 
and the animal is unconscious. However, the big problem with this is that the eye deviates ventrally. This is no good since we want the eye to remain in a central position, especially if we are doing eye surgeries wherein the corneal surface itself is the surgical area. This central eye position is only possible if your anesthetic plane is light or deep. Again, not good. This is where neuromuscular blockers or NMBs come in handy. An NMB will provide skeletal muscle relaxation and will prevent the movement of the eye ventrally, and it will keep it in a central position. NMBs work as paralytics or peripheral muscle relaxants. How does it work? What is the mechanism of action? They block the acetylcholine from occupying the receptors in a neuromuscular junction or a synaptic cleft. This prevents contraction and leads to muscle paralysis. However, these drugs have no analgesic or sedative effects. This is why NMBs are given after the anesthesia. Reflexes that are normally used to indicate anesthetic depth, like palpebral reflexes, jaw tones, will not be present. Remember, neuromuscular blockers are paralytics. You must make sure that an appropriate anesthetic depth is reached before administering NMBs. Yes, you need to induce anesthesia first before the paralytics. If we paralyze the animal first before anesthesia, this will cause severe anxiety to the animal and consequently make the eye problem worse because its intraocular pressure would increase. Also, NMBs cause paralysis of all skeletal muscles, not just the eye muscles. This means that it can also paralyze the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm, which is in charge of respiration. You must anticipate sudden respiratory depression. You must be ready to provide oxygen therapy with efficient ventilation. Also, reversal agents must always be available. Now, what are these neuromuscular blockers? The first example is atracurium. This is a neuromuscular blocker with a duration of action of 15 to 30 minutes. This is given at a fraction of a dose to assess the animal's respiratory function, and the remaining dose is given five minutes later. Another NMB is pancuronium, which has a longer duration of action at maximum of 60 minutes. This drug has a selective cardiac vagal blockade, causing a temporary increase in heart rate after it is administered. Since neuromuscular blockers may cause severe respiratory depression because the respiratory muscles are paralyzed, reversal agents must always be accessible if you choose to use neuromuscular blockers. There are two drug categories which are used. One, is the anticholinesterase drugs and two, the anticholinergic drugs. How do these two work? Anticholinesterase rather, uh, drugs inhibit the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, which degrades or breaks down acetylcholine. When this is given to the animal, it helps or it allows the acetylcholine to accumulate and eventually displace the neuromuscular blockers from the receptors, leading to muscle contraction. Examples of these drugs are neostigmine, given at a dose of 0.02 mg per kg, and edrophonium, which is given at a dose of 0.05 to 0.1 mg per kg. However, anticholinest... Uh, Anticholinesterase drugs would sometimes cause muscarinic or parasympathetic effects such as bradycardia, hypotension, bronchospasm, 
increased respiratory secretions, and in some cases, vomiting. These are prevented with the use of anticholinergic drugs, such as atropine and glycopyrrolate. These are preferably given before the anticholinesterase drugs to mitigate its bad effects. Atropine is the drug of choice for severe bradycardia because, it, because of its fast onset and increased cardiac action. Maybe you think, why can't they just be given at the same time to counteract the effects? Well, some preparations exist, like this edrophonium with atropine. However, one note, if you only have neostigmine available in your clinic, this must always be preceded with atropine.